Well, good evening. We are here with Richard Watson. Uh, he's an alumnus of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts here in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and tell you all about Richard because Richard can tell you about himself. But he's one of the, what I call a true historian of the art world. Uh, he's been painting for at least 50 years, maybe, if not longer. Um, he considers himself a representational and, what's the word, collage artist? Um, I would say mixed, multi, me, mixed media artist. Multi-dimensional yeah. type of artist? Mixed, mixed, mixed media? media. Yeah. Okay, these terms are sometimes <laughs> can be a little bit confusing. Yeah. But the, the purpose of Richard being here is to talk about the, the, the historical significance of, of black artists in this world and the importance of it, its relationship to past, present, and future. So Richard is going to start out by talking about whatever he wants to talk about. Wow. Okay, well, well, I guess I have to go to the beginning of why I'm an artist today and what encouraged me to become an artist as definably as I can, because what we call artists, black artists, and art, you know, they're discretionary when you look at what that means. Um, we are more popularized now to call it black art, black artists, but the idea of what art was for traditionally was to satisfy the elite, you know, in the society who could afford to have images and products that were produced by just generic people who were at their own lifestyle of being creative. And art as a commodity was controlled in ancient times by the aristocracy and people who had art could afford to buy art and pay for someone to produce it for them so that it would sort of like espouse who they were in terms of popularity and control over people's destiny because the economy was something that drove your existence and not a lot of people were trying to uh, exist on creating something for an audience that wasn't there unless they were favored by a family or favored by an aristocracy like the religious, like the Pope, or getting a commission. To, and their honor was not held in what they created. It was about who could sustain what they did in perpetuity of just trying to do something now and then go back to the field and work hard labor. It was a life of leisure. And a lot of people could afford to have that, to say that I choose to try to have the amenities of life by doing something I like. Was, was, was art being created back in, in I, I assume you're talking about the, the days when we were in, enslaved. Well, I'm talking about the caveman first. I'm talking going back to when <laughs> okay. I'm going back to when people people express themselves by making marks okay. and creating creating images that they respected and, and revered as being something unique. The the money value started to determine the, the worth of the person who could produce it and how frequently they could produce it and under what conditions they were producing it. And black art, and I, you know, and I, sometimes I, I sort of like... Um, find, it, find it offensive? I, no, it's not offensive at all. It's fine. It's categorizing art because somebody black does it or is the art something that represents what is... Um, significant to black people's experiences. And that's very important to discern what it is and why it is and what, who does it. You know, because white people do art that has a remnants of black experience and black culture. And I've been in situations where I've been marveling at uh, watercolors where these you know, little kids from Jamaica were, I said, this is so beautiful, this outshines anybody I've seen. Who's the brother who did this? And the guy said, well, he's as white as driven snow. He's from Florida. <laughs> so, 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 so how did the, what, so what created this category? Why is there what people will say is white art, and why is there what people say is black art? Well, it's not white or black. I think it's about European, um, the Eurocentric vision of uh, 
their gaze on art is what is there to represent their culture. First of all, the Medici's were paying for something that maybe was being produced to enhance their position of wealth. Black artists started to come to the fore um, sometime after the Civil War when artists were looked upon as being creative, but they were actually being functionary. They were creating pottery. Dave the Potter is one of the earliest examples of an artist, and his pottery was something that he was making just because he couldn't make pots. And there were artists who were iron smiths, who were doing those gates you find in New Orleans, and the kinds of gates that now Italians get the credit for having produced as fine ironworkers, but the African were working with iron when the Europeans were in caves. So we had to look at the juxtaposition of how we've been compromised and exploited for what we can produce naturally. And it, called, it becomes art because they commodify a lot of the things that we were able to produce and put out here and have um, be exploited by for a price. There, but there are those who say that the that, 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 Art, black art, became recognized as a result of the Harlem Renaissance, and well, I, I take issue with that because yeah. there was a lot of artists back prior to mm -hmm. that recognition who flee to Europe because their work wasn't being recognized mm -hmm. here here in the states. Is that well? I, I think they were appreciated as people more so in Europe than the work itself. They happened to be able to produce their work in a comfortable environment because otherwise it would be mechanized to just be an art machine and that somebody would allow you to do that but the black aesthetic in Europe was under a different kind of um, circumstance the parameters were not like that you're black it's that you're talented and you have a universal spirit that they were not um, interested in your past as an enslaved they didn't see you as an enslaved or enslavable class of people. They didn't have the three-fifths of a man thing out front that you were subhuman, things like that. You take people like Red Top, Rick Top and uh, Josephine Baker and the, the kinds of writers who were producing works over there. James Baldwin and Richard Wright and those people came later because they left the American um, aristocracy or racist regimes to go away somewhere where they could be judged in a cultural manner or they could be appreciated culturally and for their expertise in being a writer, a dancer, a musician, and whatever. But the black arts movement, the Harlem Renaissance came about when blacks were leaving the South and coming North, and they could uh, pretty much have, have more accessibility to producing art and having a community of their own. And in Harlem, where, where blacks congregated at that point, they still were discriminated against and the black talents that they had, they weren't even allowed to go to the places where they were performing as human beings. <coughs> so, excuse me. So, to go in the back door <coughs> of a place where you are entertaining people of uh, social ability and economic superiority because they controlled everything, your art form was perfected because you had to satisfy the public, but at the same time you had the ability to do so. Being black sort of flourished because the ones who could make the money and, and entertain people had accessibility to go into those places as an entertainer, but they couldn't go in there as a patron or as a customer. So, so, so Richard, what, what about the art that they were producing? Were they producing art then to satisfy themselves and, and, and their cultural experience, experience or were they, were they producing art to satisfy that other person or other population out there so they could be recognized? Well, I think there are two things that happened politically. They weren't trying to satisfy the other people. Art, we're looking at visual art and we're looking at three-dimensional art, we're looking at music, entertainment, the whole schism. After World War I, when uh, blacks came back here to America, the energy for creativity was spurred by some whole program, radically speaking, the Harmon Foundation, rich philanthropists that fostered a way for talented artists, black artists, to be seen by these exhibitions that they, that they funded. 
like have an annual exhibition in different places where they work with travel from one institution to another. And if people like Jacob Lawrence, Aaron Douglas, um, Augustus Savage, these are people who were in Harlem who were producing work within a certain parameter in certain communities. So the Harlem uh, community art centers were fostered by black, by white money. So they had a sense of a staging so they could produce the work and they, they had no kinds of uh, limitations or uh, prohibited. They were able to express what they were, were doing. Uh, Augusta Savage came from the South. Uh, Aaron Douglas was in the South. So the Southern artists were able to come North and do some things that were being spotlighted around for the appreciation of the whole country at large. The themes that the black artists were starting to put out is what we started to identify as black art. Art that reverberated our experiences, our sufferings, our pain, our struggles, and our aspirations. So that's why when we call it black art, we're really thinking about what kinds of images are we producing or are being produced that engenders a black experience. Uh, could be in every meeting you could think about, and the more you look at it, anything could be a, an expression of a black experience if you are black. Whatever you do is going to come from within. It's not something a commission represents, something that somebody wants to see. Let, let me ask you about the marketplace at that time. Mm -hmm. So they're creating art that represents their experiences, mm -hmm. and they want that work to be bought and shown. Uh, to the to the world, uh, were do you think they were successful? Well, I, I don't think they were looking at a marketplace when they say, well, "If I do this, stuff, somebody will buy it." Because if we were, they were producing art out of a passion for the expression of that's the outlet for some of the pain, you know, some of the denial. So that it was almost like forging forging something that's concrete out of something that's miserably induced, you know. That pain and the pressure of the denial of one's selfhood created that kind of outpouring of authentic art that was an expression that was authentic, true, and had value to it. It's not they were trying to please people. But 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 art, me being a, being a collector, art has a value. And my point is, I'm wondering if that philosophy that they had then was such that, look, I got to make a living off of what I'm creating. And, and you, you, don't, you don't really hear stories about how successful Aaron Douglas was back when they was creating those works mm -hmm. back, during the, back during the Harlem Renaissance. So I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is where the galleries, where the white galleries say, look, I'm going to take your work, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 move on and sell your work. I don't, was, it, was that happening back then? No, no, it wasn't happening. Um, they saw a way to exploit an avenue of consistent creative form that they were not produce, you know, producing on their side of their culture that was typical of an experience of black people. They weren't giving them, they were giving them pennies and nickels and dimes for that work and taking it to a marketplace that they take that and blow it up 250 times, a thousand times. They give somebody five dollars for something they bring to a market in Chicago or New York or Boston and sell it for hundreds of dollars. So that was an exploitive kind of way of merchant, mer merchandising black, black output. Um, they weren't getting fair market price for their work. In, in fact, there was no rubric for saying this is black art so it's worth but you say it's worth. I think a lot of times it was to satisfy some of that white angst to say, look, I'm supporting this, I got this, this nigga over here did it, and I got a lot of nigga art. If you want to come by my place, I'll show you these bowls over here, I've got some quilts over here, I've got some bracelets over there. We got a whole lot of folks, my brother down there in Florida, we got a group of people called the Highway Men. And the Highway Men had to sell their art out of trunks of their cars. And You've probably seen some of that work or uh, that's like the sunset and the sunrise, orange and black and gold, and it's beautiful, it's radiant. They, uh, I think 
couple of the last surviving highwaymen died a couple of years ago. There were two here in Philadelphia area, but there's a white guy from Canada, um, Anthony Hayden, who is now trying to revive the highwaymen. He's done a book on them. He's tried to represent some, of the, several of them while they were still alive. And their art is something that they were able to produce as, as merchants, as vendors along the highways in Florida back 30 years ago. They didn't get popularized as much as the women's uh, art making uh, G's been. The G's been women who produce quilts now. Man, they have a network of a tradition that's been passed for generations now, three generations. Grandparents, daughters, granddaughters, and they pass that along within their community. They have been honored in video, and there's some very beautiful documentaries that people have gone down and captured the essence of their innocence of doing things because it's been passed down in a traditional way. Um, so that's a solid base statement that our culture has generated from within without um, having any kind of idea about what it's worth. It's worth more intrinsically than it is economically for the most part. Now there's a commercial, like there is a commercial market now for black arts. We're going to go when, back to black now. But, but, when, but when, did that, when did that market start? I mean... In the, six, in the 60s. Okay. Um, there were two waves of it, you know, like the black, the, the 60s in terms of the uh, revolutionary, reactionary art, the answer to um, the protests uh, against segregation in the South, because black people in the North didn't see it. Uh, they thought segregation was okay, but they didn't see it as segregation. They saw it as black community versus white community, but they were also redlined and also uh, kept out of unions. They were also, like Malcolm said, you're not up north, you, you were up south. You're not anywhere else but up south, and they're down south. So the idea of art being a tool for easing the pain, I think the commercialization of the art ex of the black experience started creating a market for selling it for people to ease some of the pain of remembering how things used to be and then also making statements that were definitely counteracting the racist kinds of things that we had to confront as black people. The protest art became a movement. Graffiti became a protest art movement. Inner city artists were doing things on walls. They weren't doing representational art, but that art form of graffiti and writing on walls is now a highly prized, legitimate form of art. Big bucks. People collect some of the wall writers' arts who've grown to be big time in New York and other places. So all of those pieces are very collectible. Um, we have local artists who capitalize on the civil rights movement, the black power movement, through academic training and through learning how to articulate what we want to do through the tools that we acquired at, at PAFA, at Tyler, at all of the art schools across the country, San Francisco, um, Atlanta. The black experience was translated through the art forms that we all have been able to develop a skill level and a skill set. It didn't always mean that what we produce had to look like somebody we knew. So the energy that goes into what black artists do, sometimes it's esoteric work. It's Richard Hunt, for instance, Richard Hunt's sculpture. And this piece right here, this, a piece of work like that, then it has a shona stone that comes out of Zimbabwe. That's a, a oriented black experience coming out of black culture in the black continent, but it has a certain quality of <laughs> passion. That's what it is. Passion that goes into the work. It's like you you put your soul and your blood, your sweat and tears into the work, and it it sort of it identifies the creator as one who has experiences in life. And you put that into the work and it resonates for the person who appreciates that. It's not like a cookie cutter thing and it has individuality, but it also has familiarity as well. It has to have energy, it has to have movement, it has to have a quality of strength. And so that's what black people are about. Endem endemically, we are black, we are strong, we have pride, and when we do exercise it, 
through our art forms, there's a motivation that comes out of our past experiences, whether they are personal experiences or ones that are ancestral that we relate to. In my own work, I relate to my ancestors' stories of oppression and uh, the stories that my grandparents told me of how hard it was picking tobacco and pulling, pick, pulling tobacco, picking cotton, and uh, getting these thorns in your fingers. My grandmother had things that in her hands that were things from the picking cotton that had still little pecks and marks and all that. But they saw those as badges of color. Those are badges of honor that they wore those scars proudly because they pick a hundred well, they pick a hundred pounds of cotton as a family. And they pick a pound. A pound of cotton is a challenge for me. A pound of cotton is hard to pick. <laughs> so, so, so Richard, when, when do you think uh, I mean they say the Harlem Renaissance was important. It, 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 it gave us presence, black artists presence. And then you have the movement of the of the of the sixties with the with the protests and and, and, and those things, but the, my, my, my question is, is, has always been and continues to be, okay, as a black artist, you want, you want your work to be viewed by not just your own people, but by, 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 by others. And ha, ha, has the movement gone in that direction? Of course. Yeah, I think we, we as art producers see what has happened before us in terms of the collectors of artists like our mentors and our heroes. Uh, I can name uh, Romeo Bearden, um, John Baker. Charles White. Yeah, Charles White. Um, I mean, Elizabeth Catlett, Alma Thomas, Henry Tanner. Richard Hunt, I mentioned him. Richard Mayhew, there's so many people. Louis Sloan, Paul King. So the names go on and on and on, but if you look at their work, they still embody the sense of a very close kind of relationship to who they are as black people and how they want to express it through the craftsmanship of their facility to work. Uh, there are some artists who typify kinds of rituals in black life, like uh, funerals, church revivals, baptisms. Um, some of us now, in a more modern sense, look at the uh, interiors and the physicality of our environments. Like I like to do deteriorating landscapes. R.L. Washington does the inner city rhythm of black people. James Atkins captures ceremony and intimate moments of people who celebrate their lives in a familiar way. So and you said, and you know what's interesting about what you just said? You just captured the essence of their of their work. They live yeah. their work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just had, I just had to say this. Go ahead. And so, so the black artists regionally have have um, emanated from a sense of their environmental causes for being artists, and a lot of the work from the West Coast. Very few black artists. Have in the west, uh, from the west coast, um, articulate the kind of art that comes out of the south on the east coast. Very few, and the west coast has a whole different kind of atmosphere and attitude about art being um, more free flowing. They're cavalier, They're free flowing with the yeah. work. Yeah, it's movement more, pieces. Yeah, driftwood, uh, Arizona. You know, the native uh, indigenous peoples' influence on the west side of the world. But I don't know why black artists in on the West have not grown and grown in a magnificent identification. Well, now Jacob Lawrence is from Seattle. You can't get any further west than Seattle. And Jacob Lawrence is one of our premier godfathers in the art world. And he has typified Harriet Tubman and Toussaint Tour and the whole idea of rebellion as resistance and captivity. Uh, so we have these What about what about Ed Clark? Ed Clark, the New Yorker, who I knew Ed Clark before he passed. And he, but he was out in California, right? No, he was in New York. He, he had spent most of his time in New York. And I met him, he, he and Richard Mayhew and, uh, in New York. Ed Clark used to you know, get up on the ladder and pour paint from his. I could get up on the ladder. And, 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 take, and, take, a, and take a broom. And get a broom. And, 
Yeah, put it You know, that, that's, that's to be noted too as authentic expression of black art because he's a black man, he's expressing his passion through color. And there's no paradigm that says you have to be able to draw things that look like black people in the world. Otherwise, you know, we have color field artists that don't use any, uh, Sam Gilliam, for instance, you know, Sam Gilliam is one of the top. And he was making a lot of things happen because he innovated something that had nothing to do with black people. You know, he draped the art museum with canvas. <laughs> you know, and I said, whoa, you know, like, he's struggling trying to put some on the canvas and then draped the building with it. So that's where the, the art establishment comes in. There's an art establishment. The good old white boys in New, in New York um, were responsible for being a, the, the what do they call the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the high they were the high priest of the art world. And if you wasn't a part of that kind of movement, Lichtenstein and, and um, I forget their names now because it's just so it's so appalling that all these old white men. Uh, could control a whole marketplace and then they will also play into their higher up, higher class rich philanthropists and people like the DuPonts and the Kennedys and all the people who could afford to say, well, I can afford this and you can't. So Andy Warhol had a factory of people who would come, he would come in and he would have all these people there shaking in their boots and he would say, well, what, what kind of ideas do we have today? Well, that's not an idea, you know. What? Oh, I know what we'll do. What's your idea? And Andy Warhol didn't have too many ideas after he did the Sam Campbell soup cans. He had people around him who appeased him and just suck up to him. So he had created an industry out of his name. And so all of those abstract things of Elvis Presley, then he took white, white culture and, and he indemnified that. He made that the way to go, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, even down to a cartoon character, replication of an idea. So in black folk, we don't replicate the same idea. We have so much to draw from that every artist has some validity drawing from their own personal memories, their own personal experiences, and related to us as a people. So there's an open window for black art. Black what, do you, what do you mean by open window? I mean, there's no limit to what black art can be. Quentin Morris, one of our contemporaries, has never painted anything but black circles. And Quentin has gotten fellowships and, and all kinds of accolades, and videos, and things like that. He's embraced as a... Larry Becker sells out Quentin Morris paintings that are they're black. We just had a show in the fall uh, at, at uh, the college on Glenside. What's it called? Arcadia. Arcadia, yeah. He had a big show out there recently in the last several months. But that's to be embraced as well because when you look at a self-identifying artist, enough to say that I declare that I'm black, you can see my art is black. <laughs> oh yes, that's clever. But it's not just clever because people have done those single color, color field things for years on the white high art market in New York. So we can break that threshold and say that whatever people are doing in a contemporary way, it doesn't have to say, oh, woe is me, woe is us. If you have a, a commodity, you have, if you have a commodity that you have an audience that will consume it, that's where it all gets down to the books now. Black people can get into the doors, a seat at the table, and if, if it's sellable and people buy it, then it becomes lofted to be predatable. So you're, so you're saying that the, it seems that the world for an artist, for a black artist, is, is, is good. Well, see, black people, a lot of black artists don't call themselves black artists. You, you'll find people say, I'm not black, I'm an artist. I'm not, I'm not just, you know, and that's what's kind of like, well, you nigga, you're black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. I was, you like that? I do, I like that, I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I was, 
I was, and we were in New York this past week, and so we went to the, the, the Harlem Fine, it's called the Harlem Fine Art Show. And, and there were, it was, well, it was all black artists, which I thought was interesting. I said to somebody, I said, you know, I'm surprised they don't have any white, there's white artists who, who paint uh, images that relate to black folks. But there were no white, no white artists there. But I tell you, there were a number of white folks in there scouring the artwork. And people like Pam Brown, who you know, mm -hmm. have, has told me that black art right now is hot. Mm -hmm. That white, white, the white population loves the work. Why do you think that? I got two. I, I have two reasons why I think that. But go ahead. Let me well, go. we have we have a society now that's reverberating. Of uh, the parody on our side, we have a chance to express our angst and our rebellious resentment for how we've been treated in a very creative way. And but black, but white people, I don't know if to assuage their white guilt or not, but again, you know, it, that could turn into a very exploitive move as well. You know, there's a way to exploit people through um, supporting their wave of output with uh, not an equitable input for the cash. So it becomes a competitive kind of situation where if white people are going to appreciate black art, then all black people start creating things that for the black market. And how do you produce work for a white market and you don't have a, a, a guideline for what the art is significant of? There's no template for black art and for what white people pay for the art that they like. Why do they want to buy black art so much all of a sudden? That's a good question too. Why would black art soar in a marketplace where white people are buying it more than black people? You know? I don't have an answer to that question. I don't either, but see, that's why the whole thing, the conundrum is getting caught up in how to decide on how to produce black when you're already black. How do you produce art that's going to take your art into a, a, an arena that now validates it for what white people will buy it? Well, what I, what I hear from uh, uh, white people when it comes to black art is the colors. They like the colors, the vibrance of a piece. Um, it, it, it speaks to them because it's so colorful. But they're pale. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like if you look at corporate, if you look at, at corporate America, Insane. corporate America, corporate America, who, you know these mega, megatron buildings they're putting up with all kinds of, uh, you know, futuristic dimensions to them. They, the art that they want to put in those buildings are not images of black references either. Now, people who say, "Come in the room. I want to show you something. I want to show you. Come in. Come on back here." Come on, hey, close the door. Look at that. For what? Some black art. <laughs> you know, that's for their reason. Their reason for having it there is to appease their own culture. I don't think that, you know, they are solidifying the fact that we declare that black art should be collected by all of you guys, you know. Um, I invited all of you here. I know you're all white, but the, this, the, hear me out. Black art is in. Now, Harry, you know that building you just put up down there on uh, on the square. You've got 14 floors. You don't have anything. Fill it with black art. Trust me, it'll pay off. <laughs> so that's the white paradigm. If they want to sell black art, you know, they should have this thing where they just beat our doors down, and every gallery on, and every black artist you don't even have to invite them to come and see the work. They could just say, "Hey, where's the list of? Hey, here's the one over here. It's like a scavenger hunt." But I don't know how much water that holds, Adrian. I'm not trying to, you know, say that as, as bogus, but if there are people who say that the marketplace now is asking for it, then that puts another kind of artificial kind of impetus on black artists to say, well, I'll buy into that. Ron, you want to buy into that? No. Come on, man. You make a lot of money. Why not? <laughs> you, stop, you stop painting this stuff. It'd be hypocritical to me. To me, if it's not painting it, something that inspiring you to paint it, to me it's artificial. And an average viewer that knows anything about art is going to look at it and be able to determine whether it's genuine from the artist's soul or whether it's something he's doing just to make a dollar. I don't think art should be done just to be, make money from it. 
but it's something innate in us. It's a gift from God, and the only way to make it manifest it while we're here is to execute that, whether you get paid for it or not. It's something you do, you love it, you have a gift with it, and you want to share something with everybody else. That's how I look at it. Are, are you speaking, you two, Mr. Richard has been around paying for well over, well over 40 or more years, so is that the reason why you answer? Yes. See, a young artist may say something totally different. Definitely. <laughs> it's a balance. Why do you say that, Steve? Because it's, it comes from your heart and soul, but you also, for a young artist, you want to come out. You want to commodify. Now, now, Steve is a photographer. Mm -hmm. So, yes, photography. How, how was that? Has that been part of the movement? Like it does, yes. And I was talking to Steve about that earlier. Um, there's great black photographers in this country who are still doing it. Jamel Shabazz in New York. You've got Daoud Bay, Chester Higgins, um, Micheline Thomas. So the Black Arts Movement is replete with photographers as well. And the fact that we have not sold out to the fact that I talked about the smartphone. The smartphone is not a smartphone. You know, it's a mechanical device that has a flat kind of resolution of, of, of a composite of things that they are selling. You got you got media artists, but there's room for everybody who's done things with the tradition of the traditions that we build our craft on. The technical part of photography, young people can't um, they can't match what a photographer who knows ins and outs of technology and how to produce a quality photograph. They can't burn and dodge. They can't. Um, extrapolate what a good photograph is from a bad photograph. They can just shoot, 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 shoot. So, so Steve, how, how, how has your experience been as a, as a black photographer? I think my experience is a, is a little uh, uh, atypical, um, partially because I've traveled all over the world with my photography and I like national parks. I go to places that most black photographers don't uh, um, frequent so to speak. So my imagery is, but I also go to protest, you know, so I have access to a certain kind of view through my lens, more of my life experience that I, I want to be unique in, you know, so a lot of my photography isn't the black face. It's not, it's not a portraiture. It's not the black image, so to speak. It's all of it, you know, it's my contemporary life as a black individual. And I'm saying as a black individual, I like national parks. I don't just like urban settings or urban environments and if I can bring this to the world in a larger sense then I can be both Gordon Parks and Ansel Adams. I don't have to choose between the two. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So does, it, does anyone, I know, I know someone has a question for Richard. Uh, I see, I told you Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have a question. And it really refers to, you know, the black experience and, and what we found, you know, a lot of clients are more interested in figurative work. They want to see images of themselves, um, whatever medium that's made in. And when we think of the abstract artists, you know, historically, Alma Thomas, Norman Lewis, um, Richard Mayhew, they are not doing, they weren't doing that figurative work. And, just your saying, although it didn't show us as people, it was still out of their experience as a black human being. Can you speak a little more about that? And I named those three, those happen to be three of my favorites, but um, certainly that could be extended. Well, I, I, I think it's the same that the artist is white, and you question why he's producing that work. And white artists can produce a plethora of things that have nothing to do with white people. It, it does not have to justify the fact that it's a valid piece of art. Black people, I have a good friend, um, Hakeem Mahabuti, his name was Donnell Lee, back during the, during the uh, civil rights, APEC, you know, when we're talking about major con contributors like uh, Sonny Sanchez and Leroy Jones or Mir Baraka. And he says that the measure of people's culture is like you walk into any black person's house. You want to see what kind of artwork they have on their walls and what kind of books they have on their bookshelves. 
Now, per capita, I don't know what the percentage is now, that how people furnish their homes, but I would dare say that I don't think there's a lot of bookcases that are covering people's walls. People of a certain generation may have, you know, we may be some of us the last vestiges of people who even buy books on, on the market. Now, the young people don't collect books and put them on the shelf. They don't have to. They got Kindles and they got other things. Artwork is all about, always about some representation of a culture that may be something that's reminiscent of a poster or something of a concert. But in terms of art and its aesthetic value, what we do here and what we surround ourselves with is an emotional connection to times spent, times witnessed, times referenced through our associations with people who have lived a life of substance. So it's, it resonates the fact that someone has a value of their own life, their conscience of uh, their, their cognizant of what conditions exist socially and historically. So that's where the gift comes from. How do you translate all of those emotions into a physicality that will be concrete enough for people to, to have questions about it? And not just say, oh, that's nice. Well, that's what, you know. Georgia O'Keeffe, you, you're familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe? Yes. I mean, she was dedicated to being uh, an artist, artist, artist of the earth who saw flowers and saw colors very differently than just a nice little rose or a bouquet. She got immersed in the organic part of the art. You know, there are people who ground their own colors. They could go buy tubes of paint, but there's some artists who grind colors so they get the right the right temperature for the color they want to use in their work. That's old school. A lot of people are very impatient with the immersing themselves in the experience from, from start to finish. So there's a white artist who can paint black stuff better than black artists, if we want to go there. Uh, because technically speaking, they're very technical people. Japanese people, we had a Japanese choir come to the African American Museum some years and everybody was, they were downstairs in the auditorium and people, we thought it was from Mississippi. <laughs> and we, and they were too, we thought it was from down south somewhere, the revival, I was, I was tapping my foot. Go <laughs> down there and there's a group of Japanese kids who were touring the country doing gospel. So, you know, I don't know about the sanctity of our culture being self-guided or self-protected or how, what are the parameters for how we gauge and how do we preserve our authenticity throughout the generations to come. I don't know. That's the test though, right? Well, I think there's a connection. If they can, no artists do it, and they, we need to have connection to our people who are creative and talented and know who's doing what, and we have to have a conversation like I'm having here with you guys, uh, going into schools. I do things in schools. I think, Ron, you've done things in, in workshops. The Black History Month, I used to go to the white schools more than the black schools, go to the white schools in Glenn Square and Haverford. All the places want somebody black to come and talk to their kids. And I would do workshops, and, you know, painting clothes and things like that. I share my talents with them. And the whole aspect of their exposure culturally sometimes is broader because we, I don't say that we are at fault for not immersing their kids. Kids come to the museum, um, black children from all over, white children from all over, they're equally discordant because they just don't get the ex aesthetic exposure anymore. There's some artists out there that, that don't know their history. Yeah, many, many, many. Correct, many, you're right. So yeah. I make myself available, you know, I mean, um, there's nothing like seeing the innocence of a child who's never seen something before and you can approach them with, hey, you can do this, man, you know. I go to workshops and the, and the teachers are telling the kids, don't know that, Robbie, don't, don't worry. I say, hey, help, whoa, whoa. I say, why don't you take a break, man? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to embarrass you in your class, but, I say, you know, let them do this, you know. They never get a chance to do this, you know. And they don't get a chance to do the art that they could be doing if you let them explore and they don't get a chance to see the black person who does the art. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to bond something here, make a connection so that they can have confidence in something that's coming from somebody that looks like them. So, mm -hmm. so Richard, let me, let me just ask this, this question. It, it, for going forward, in your opinion, mm -hmm. 
And Brian, you could you could jump in. Steve, you could jump in. Your artist is it is the, the is black art in, in a good place right now? Is it is it such that that there's a legacy of importance to black art that that we should be that we can yeah. be proud of? Yeah, it's in a great place now because there might there are many more uh, younger people and generations to, to come or there. They're here now, they're not to come. They are exercising their talents in a very positive, affirmative way. Afrofuturism is a phrase that a lot of people are unfamiliar with, but it has to do with when the Black Panther movie came out, right? The Marvel comics and the Marvel productions created an arena of, or a certain kind of environment for black people to see that your fantasy world can be your real world and you can create within that void, you can fill that void with any aspiration of your own design, and you can be self-validating because you don't have to be critiqued by white standards or European values. So what black people are doing with fashion, what they're doing with cinema, what they're doing, uh, Ava DuVernay and her, her explorations into the culture and the history part, but also within the dynamic kinds of uh, people who are doing films, the medium has expanded to black people, to Jennifer Gordon Peele, um, uh, and you know, just a whole a showering of black aesthetics that are being allowed to express themselves. And it has a lot to do with the mechanization of media. Media is going to be the platform through which black people can really expand their parameters of creativity beyond your imagination. I use beyond imagination in a lot of my in my uh, thoughts about what I'm calling things that I put out here. Because if you can imagine it, you have to do something about it. And when you do something about it, that's creating black art. It's a good way of ending. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.